I'm Meredith Baker of CTIA. Thank you for joining us. In recent events, we've celebrated how the wireless industry stepped up to the challenge of keeping all Americans connected during the pandemic. And I wanna stress all. Wireless has always played a key role in connecting Americans. I'm particularly proud that the wireless industry has long been the on-ramp to the internet for communities of color. MMTC's recent report on wireless and the digital divide, which you should definitely check out, was the genesis of this event. I'm reminded that a decade ago, MMTC observed the quote, minority wireless miracle in looking at how different groups connected and engaged online. That miracle very much continues today. A quarter of Latino and almost 20% of African-Americans are smartphone only internet households. Central to this success has been wireless competition. Competition to deploy and deliver both services and devices that meet every budget and every household need. What I particularly liked about the MMTC's assessment was that it focused on the opportunities connectivity creates, framing why closing the digital divide is so vital. It is about enhancing quality of life, improving healthcare outcomes, transforming jobs and education, and reducing the impacts of climate change. And since I'm plugging reports, I also wanna recommend CTIA's first ever diversity, equity, and inclusion report detailing our industry's longstanding and strong commitment to diverse workforces and community investment. We are lucky to have with us today key leaders from AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon to discuss their company's remarkable initiatives. Now, before we do that, I'm pleased to be joined today by Robert Branson, President and CEO of MMTC. He is no stranger to this space and MMTC is thriving under his leadership across traditional advocacy as well as community engagement. He is driving important digital awareness campaigns to get everyone connected. Thank you so much for joining us, Bob. It's great to have you here with us today. Thank you very much, Meredith, for inviting, us, inviting me. I, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here and to talk to your audience today. I really want to dig into your paper. I have it right here. But let's start with a broader lens. There is rightfully a lot of focus right now on home broadband, but probably not enough about the role of mobile too. So as you study the issue, how do you think about wireless and connecting communities of color? You know, Murder, I, I go back way back to uh, when at the start of my career in, in this area when I work for Verizon Wireless and I, and I see the development of wireless, how much it's been transforming, both in terms of the technology for wireless, you know, going from 3G to 4G to 5G, uh, to the types of phones and, and the uses. And, and, and what I've noticed though, more importantly, is that wireless has played a major role in closing the digital divide. You know, in other words, communities of color, low-income households, rural communities, you know, uh, we're all far behind respect to internet you know, and, and having uh, access to internet. Now all these households are able to connect wirelessly at almost the same level and sometimes even more than other groups, you know? And, and this is frankly due to the fact that wireless is accessible, it's affordable and flexible, you know? And, and, and we've seen the benefits of, of, of wireless in our communities, you know, as, as more and more wireless is being used by students, uh, by, by, by family members to connect with one another, uh, and by other industries. So I, I think wireless, wireless has really, uh, come a long way and, and help to close the digital divide that we have. I, I, I really liked how you framed that and that it bridges the, the gaps for communities that historically lag behind. Um, and in your research, you really do draw that out as well. So, um, the numbers are pretty dramatic. And I'm curious as to what MMTC concluded as to why wireless is playing such an outsized role and what has really contributed to this in your mind? 
you know, wireless is, is, is ubiquitous. You know what I mean? In other words, it's, there are three things I think that probably, probably contributed to this. One, you know, wireless is, is accessible. You know what I mean? It's almost everywhere you go, you can find a wireless signal and you can find someone with a wireless phone. You know, in, in fact, you know, but 99.9% of the people have wireless phones. Most households have multiple wireless phones. And, you know, and many these days have cut the cord so, so they don't even have uh, landline phones in the house anymore. Second, uh, based upon the competition out there, wireless has become a lot more affordable than, than when it started out. You know, there, there are a lot of low cost options that people can can do to to, to join in. Third, it, it's, it's flexible. You know, I mean, there, there are a lot of plans to choose from. There are, there are a lot of carriers out there. In fact, there, there are at least three major carriers, and a lot of smaller carriers. There are, there are plans for for kids, plans for seniors. So it, it offers a lot. But I, I think the other thing is is, is that it's mobile. And, and, and that means that uh, you, you're not locked down to one place, which is what uh, the new generation likes about it. I think the ability to, to take the same device no matter where you go. In other words, if I'm here today, I'm using my uh, wireless device. If I fly to LA, I got the same device. But if I take the train up to New York, I can use the same device and same connectivity. That's very important to, to today's world. It really is about more than just access. And I'm glad MMTC is really leading on the broader drivers around digital divide. It's about access and wireless is everywhere. It's about affordability and postpaid and prepaid options abound. When someone gets lost, it is also about relevance and device access. That is where wireless shines. So many Americans get a free pocket computer in their smartphone. And Bob, another thing that jumped out in your paper was linking connection and opportunity. It really reinforces why wireless and increasingly 5G are so important. So tell me what opportunities and use cases jump out to you, Bob? Well, we can look at a few of them. First, let's take a look at healthcare. You know, which, which is very, very uh, front and center during the pandemic. And let's be honest, we, we're still going through uh, uh, tests with COVID right now, and 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 we're still dealing with those issues. So, doctors are still visiting with patients virtually. We're still doing remote health monitoring, you know, and and other things of that nature. Uh, because of wireless, those things are made possible. In other words, you know, my mother. If she needs to see a doctor, she can see a doctor remotely because of wireless. Uh, if she, uh, if my mother-in-law, who just recently had an appointment, can do that wirelessly. So, and that's very, very important for our, for our community, and, and particularly because oftentimes, particularly in the rural, the rural parts of our country, doctors are not that close to someone's home. So, you know, uh, in in my hometown, uh, the, the closest hospital is about thirty. Uh, minutes away. So to be able to go on virtually and talk to someone and get an answer quickly, a lot better than having to get in the car and drive 30 minutes. In the area of education, you know, we learned also during the pandemic that kids had to stay home and therefore having remote classroom, being able to see the teachers, see their classmates was, was very beneficial to keep them learning during a time when, when it may not have been as safe to be in classroom. Uh, it's also, frankly, been used by a lot by colleges, and uh, and 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 that's been very good for education. In the area, in our in our community, also the area of jobs. You know, uh, with the advent of five G, a lot of new jobs were being created as, as we were uh, putting up small cells around the around the country. Hopefully, many in many communities, minority contractors and others were were applying and getting jobs. Minority workers were out there helping to do that. And also with respect to job, uh, you know, uh, wireless help with training and, and, and safety education things. Last thing I'll, I'll talk about, which is, which is in the papers also, is climate change. As, as, as we all see, you know, we need to do something to address climate change. And, and wireless is helping in that aspect, and we pointed that out. So when you look at those four things which we point out in the paper, you know, I, I think they're very key to our community. I mean, there, there, there are other things, but those are the four key 
highlights that we had in our paper. The whole paper is very interesting, but I thought those were the best. And here at CTI, we've been focused on them as well. Um, I will tell you, I, I just recently had to visit with this um, this great young African American teacher. Her name's Kai, and she's she's such a rock star. Um, but she saw budget cuts reduce their field trip opportunities in her Title I school. And so she created Kai XR, which is this amazing uh, leveraging 5G help to help kids. It's an AR VR immersive experience, and it takes them on the field trips, obviously virtually and around the country. And it's really starting to spark her kids in learning and their future dreams. And I just love that what we're seeing as many and many more young entrepreneurs are looking to wireless. And with the right policies in place, we will have even more. Let's talk about the government's role here. To your mind, what programs are working and what more can we do with government partners to connect communities of color? You know, last year we, we worked very, very closely with Congress and SEC on the emergency broadband benefit and and how do we roll all that out? And I think we we were very clear from the beginning that if the government was going to do this, it needed to be technology neutral. In other words, you know, uh, fiber would not work in every community. Uh, satellites don't work in every community, and frankly, wireless may not work. It may not be the best solution in every community. So, so we needed a tech neutral policy, which they ended up adopting. Uh, and as they move forward with the affordable connectivity program, you know, they uh, they found that uh, and then it's been working quite well as more and more people are signing up for it. And now the problem with the with with the affordable connectivity program is we've got a great program out there, but we need to talk to people. We need to teach people how to take advantage of it. We need to have people signing up, uh, which is one of the things my organization is very much involved with is. is, is now that we've got the money, we've got the, the wireless carriers we, and, and others who are offering programs where people can sign up uh, for $30 and, and get broadband speeds. We need, we need to spread, them, spread that message, but we also need to teach them how to use the program, how to, how to use the computer, how to get the most out of wireless. It, it, it's sort of like, you know, when you got your first smartphone, you know, most most of us didn't know all the capability of that smartphone, and and more we learn uh, about it, the more we could do, and the more we save time and effort, and 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 the more we liked it. And that's what we got to do with respect to the ACP and with some of these other programs. We've got to go into communities and we've got to train people on how to get the most out of them, how to figure out you know how to use fixed wireless in some instances, and that's not and and make sure they understand that's not a bad thing. That fixed wireless sometimes will, will will be the best solution for them, particularly uh, some people like, for example, who live in apartment complexes where, where where that may work a lot better than trying to wire a whole building within a short period of time. So, there, like I said, I think that's one of the things the government can help us do, help help, help us do uh, more work uh, with adoption, and and so that's that's what our mission is more this year. Is try to figure out how to do that. So how to connect the communities, and once they're connect, connected, make sure that people know how to get the most out of what they have. You're right about adoption, Bob. I got to tell you, um, believe it or not, we're st still trying to get my husband to become a full smartphone adopter. He uh, always tells me to do that thing with my phone where it gives us the directions. So you're, you're very right about teaching folks that. But I want to jump back to the EBB piece just for a second because it really has been a, a game changer to expand access and also to keep Americans connected as household costs soar, except for wireless. I think as you saw again in the inflation reports this month, wireless is, seems to be the one cost that is not going up. So I just wanted to brag a little bit, but back to EBB again, 60% um, of Americans chose wireless. And you're right that tech neutrality is very important, but Americans seem to want to use wireless. So that's a pretty good validator of really what we've been talking about. I appreciate your time. And I, I want to close with the importance of community engagement, because I know that's important to both of us. Um, and it's a real passion of yours. What are you seeing that is working and how do we drive more of these partnerships? You know, what, what works for us is, is last year uh, when we were working with the emergency broadband benefit, 
we created a new program on the MMTC called uh, Black Churches for Broadband. And the idea was to generate letters of support, generate uh, uh, contact with, with members of Congress and the White House to push for a more permanent solution than the emergency broadband benefit. Out of that, we got the American, excuse me, the Affordable Connectivity Program. Well, there's still more work to be done. So this year we pivoted from, from Black Churches for Broadband to Black Churches for Digital Equity. We have uh, empowered over 25 faith leaders throughout the country to meet with our congregations, to invite others who maybe are in the community but not part of our congregation, to talk to local leaders uh, and state government, city government, community community uh, uh, people, and 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 work on how how we can spread the message, how their communities can get some of the dollars that the government has out there for them to 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 get everybody connected. Uh, we will have a day of action in September, uh, where we actually going to go boots on the ground to parking lots, church parking lots community parking lot to actually sign people up for the ACP. Uh, having said this though, but we, we, we still need those. We still need, we still need the Congress uh, to look at making the ACP more permanent. In other words, providing more funds for the ACP. We also, we also are encouraging them to fully fund the ECF because we think that, that money should be given there as well. So that's what we're doing. You know, we, we said we, we have, Resources nowadays, like I said, 25 plus faith organizations that will go out there and help work with their communities. And and let, let, while I say, let me make it clear. While I say our program is Black Churches for, for Digital Equity, we're not we're not we're not exclusive. We think other faith organizations, other communities should also be doing the same thing. And and we encourage them, and we'd be happy to work with them as well, because you know the, the goal is to close the digital divide. The goal is is to make sure that uh, our communities get connected. And, that, and, and, and I think I appreciate the efforts of organizations like CTIA and others who, who work with us and, and help support us in that mission. Because, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's something that I think benefits the country and benefits all of us. So, I, so I, let me take a moment today and, and thank CTIA and, and you for that effort. Because, you know, uh, we can't do Black Churches for Digital Equity without strong partners. And, and CTA is one of our strong partners. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate that, Bob. But really, I, what I really do love is what you're doing with Black Churches. It's just, it's so important that we bring these digital equity decisions to communities directly. And I, I really applaud your leadership. Um, you know, there's there's one other place where carriers, this is, you know, where carriers are really stepping up here too. And whether it's uh, AT&T's Connected Living Centers or T-Mobile's Project 10 Million or, or Citizen Verizon Initiative, they are all stepping into this and really trying to make a difference. And we're seeing real innovation and investment into these communities. So I think that's probably a perfect segue to our next conversation. But before we do that, I do want to give you a chance to wrap up our conversation. I thought it was important to do this paper and, and, the, and the work with CTA uh, because I have seen the impact of, of, of wireless in our, in our community, in our lives. You know, I mean, uh, I know a lot of people, you know, who couldn't afford to buy a computer, couldn't afford to buy a tablet but they could buy a smartphone and, and use it. And, and that was a way that they were able to do so many more things uh, in terms of uh, education, being able to keep up what's going on in the classroom, being able to read books, being able to uh, look up information. Uh, you know, as you pointed out earlier, just simple things like uh, saving an environment by, by not getting lost and and, and getting directions to how to get to places where we're, 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 we're rather than riding around town, burning a lot of gas and, 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 and hurting the environment, uh, stopping uh, the, the emissions. Uh, we, we were able to use wireless to do shopping and, and other things in nature. I mean, I uh, was on a trip recently with my uh, mother-in-law and instead of uh, using the Wi-Fi at the airport, she tethered her computer uh, using 
for wireless device. So it, it, it becomes something that we all use. And, and, and in fact, I think the numbers show, and you'll see in the paper, that uh, our communities uh, use wireless more than non-minority communities in, in many cases. So that, that's why it is important to, to have a better understanding uh, of how we can uh, take what we've been doing and improve upon it and, and spread the message uh, more and, and figure out how to connect more and more people. So thank you for this opportunity. Well, Bob, that is a great way to end. And I want to thank you for joining me today. And I want to thank you for all of your work to connect Americans. It really is the, the minority wireless miracle, as your paper says. So thank you again. And um, we appreciate you being here. I'm Marcella Gadsden, Communications and Policy Manager at CTIA, and I'm excited to be joined by diversity, equity, and inclusion leads from the nation's three largest wireless networks. Allow me to introduce Jeff Luong, President of Broadband Access and Adoption at AT&T, Holly Martinez, Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion at T-Mobile, and Natalie Williams, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Verizon. Thank you all for joining us to discuss the wireless industry's commitment to diverse practices and to ensuring that communities of color have the tools they need for equal opportunities and economic advancement in today's connected society. Let's jump right in. You all lead teams that are dedicated to advancing programs and initiatives that bridge the digital divide. Can you tell me more about your group's work and how they connect to the broader culture of diversity and inclusion at AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon? We'll start with Jeff. I'm Jeff Wong. I lead uh, our Digital Divide uh, initiative here in AT&T. And here uh, in AT&T, we look at Digital Divide in terms of three aspects. We look at it from an access perspective, an adoption perspective, and an affordability perspective. And we believe it's important that we address all of these components in order to close this divide that occurs, that affects um, you know, all of America, but probably more severely uh, underprivileged and diverse communities. And so we believe that the right way to address these issues is to work together uh, between the private sector, uh, public, public entities, uh, to find solutions that allows us to address this really important uh, challenge that we all face as a society. Holly, uh, what about T-Mobile? So I head up our diversity, equity, and inclusion work at T-Mobile, and uh, there's a lot of things that we focus on. One of the things that we do is work with our external diversity council across a large body of work that is called Equity in Action, which is a five-year plan addressing how we will address equity, diversity, and inclusion across everything that touches our employees, our customers, our suppliers, and our communities. And this is many teams across the organization, but the DEI team is stewards of the work. So apart from that, we work closely with each line of business to address their business and, and people pain points with a DEI strategy, as well as our ERGs. One of the things that I am really excited about is the true heartbeat of our work is driven at a local basis. We have 50, more than 50 local DEI chapters that lead diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging within their local communities and drive it in a way that is personal to them. It's not a headquarter driven campaign, but is truly driven at a local level, heart to heart, face to face, and seeing how this work can impact teams, culture, and communities. So all of this ladders up, of course, to our equity in action promises that includes broadband, which we'll talk about and some of the other things. But in a nutshell, that's kind of what my team does. For those of you who may not know, ERG stands for Employee Resource Groups, and these are the employee initiatives that the wireless carriers have to support various diverse groups within their companies. And these ERGs, their employees, the diversity there has a large impact on their ability to support and serve diverse communities nationwide. And Natalie, can you tell us about Verizon? Yes, absolutely. So one, thank you for having me and uh, certainly Jeff and Holly looking forward to this wonderful conversation. But, you know, at Verizon, diversity, equity, and inclusion, it, it truly is an integrated shared responsibility. And so our strategy is really built around our four key stakeholders. That's our employees, our customers, society, and shareholders. So digital inclusion is a business imperative, it's, it's core to who we are and core to our citizen Verizon responsible business platform as well. 
And that platform details, uh, you know, how we intend to use our resources, our technology, and our employees to bring economic, environmental, and social advancement to our communities. Uh, we have an expansive uh, historic commitment to social responsibility. And with our Citizen Verizon framework, it's integrated throughout our overall business strategy, and it focuses on three key elements. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a lot about digital inclusion, uh, but this platform also includes climate protection and also human prosperity as well. You know, as we know, far too many people are missing out on the opportunities of the digital economy uh, because maybe they lack uh, reliable, affordable internet access or maybe they face challenges actually utilizing the technology. So when you think about our platform here at Verizon and the four key areas of digital inclusion, we truly are focused on access, affordability, adoption, and advocacy is really important as well. So we know that it's important that we support the communities and where we do business and our digital inclusion is just one way that we do that. Thank you, Natalie. And uh, I think I'm going to stick with you. You actually said something that leads into my next question. You're talking about your business strategy and human prosperity in particular. Your work doesn't stop with just connecting communities. It's pretty impressive that the wireless industry also devotes massive investments to ensuring diversity in your supply chains as well. And in 2020 alone, Carrier spent nearly $22 billion on diverse suppliers. Can you talk more about your supplier diversity programs and why it's so important for the industry to remain committed to ensuring diversity in the supply chain? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Verizon's uh, suppliers range from the world's largest, you know, original uh, equipment manufacturers to small providers of equipment and services. Um, our management of supplier relationships includes engagement intended both to mitigate social and environmental risks and also to identify opportunities to affect positive change. That's critically important to us across this body of work. So we view uh, supplier diversity as a collaborative, diverse supply chain, and it's also a business imperative. And we also see it as a competitive advantage as well. Uh, diverse suppliers help us uh, deliver complex supply chain solutions uh, that serve all of our customers' needs. And so we value the entrepreneurial spirit and we champion uh, the growth and success of the suppliers as well. And so we continue to advocate for diverse businesses, for economic empowerment in our communities, and also for social good. And uh, as of November of last year, Verizon spent $5.5 billion in goods and services with diverse suppliers, including businesses owned by people of color, uh, women, veterans, service disabled veterans, the LGBTQ plus uh, community, and also persons with disabilities. So uh, that brings our total spend over the course of 10 years to about $53 billion. So as you can say, it's, 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 pretty, it's a pretty significant investment and it's a part of our overarching business strategy. Uh, Verizon is also a charter member of the Billion Dollar Roundtable, and the Billion Dollar Roundtable is a coalition of 28 companies that spend more than a billion dollars each year with diverse suppliers. So as you can see, it's critical that our industry remains uh, committed to ensuring diversity in the supply chain. Uh, we believe it's important to spur innovation and growth across all communities while also focusing on closing the digital divide. And supplier diversity is just one way that we can do that. You know, I love, I get so excited about this conversation because everyone wins when we all focus on supplier diversity. And so I just, I love that. I love hearing about this commitment. And uh, one of the things that we're doing this year is applying to the billion dollar roundtable ourselves. And one of the, the things that we did through the pandemic is focus on how we could help small and business suppliers who have less of a of an access to capital. And so we implemented net 30 favorable payment terms to just one way that we can help our, our small and um, diverse suppliers. So I'm gonna use that as one example of how we can all innovate and, and try to provide some relief to the unique challenges that we know our small and minority businesses face. Yeah, so uh, let me add to that as well too. I think those are really great items. And, and yeah, here in AT&T, uh, we spent 13 billion dollars on diverse suppliers in 2021. So a really significant number and probably one of the highest uh, in the country among any, uh, any company. Uh, in addition to just actually spending money with diverse suppliers, um, you know, we also, we're also looking for other, other opportunities to engage with um, a diverse workforce. So um, you know, uh, a month ago, we announced a partnership with Corning 
uh, to develop a training program jointly with Corning to actually uh, develop more resources, bring more people into the industry in terms of helping um, our human capital, in terms of the people that are going to build our networks, but not just bring in, you know, just the traditional workforce, but bring in diverse workforces, workforce from, from different types of communities. So we're partnering with community organizations to identify a pipeline of resources that we could take into this training program, allowing these resources to skill up and get good paying jobs and then also contribute to our industry in terms of growing the labor resources that it, that are required to expand broadband and expand connectivity, expand 5G and eventually 6G type of services, services that will serve all communities and therefore should be built by everybody uh, uh, across the country here, you know, including uh, the diverse workforce that we're talking about here. Absolutely. And I, I love this. This is beautiful. I, I'd just like to point out that the Billion Dollar Roundtable has just a couple dozen members. AT&T and Verizon are both charter members of this organization. T-Mobile is joining this year. So if you think about it, just a couple dozen members, our telecom industry, three largest carriers, all members of the Billion Dollar Roundtable, meaning they invest more than a billion dollars each year in diverse suppliers. And for all of them, it's orders of magnitude more than one billion. It's truly incredible. Now, your work with uh, diverse suppliers is important, as also is your work with third party groups and uh, advocacy groups, which has played a key role in the wireless industry's effort to advance access, affordability and adoption. Can you highlight some initiatives that have come out of these third party partnerships? and the impacts that you've seen in the communities you, that they serve? No, I really appreciate this. This is uh, really exciting. It allows me to kind of highlight a really critical initiative for AT&T. Uh, we have committed to spend uh, uh, $2 billion over the next three years to, to address those issues that you talked about, access, affordability, and adoption. And one way we're doing that is through our connected learning centers uh, that we're deploying. We're committed to, uh, to stand up uh, 20 connected learning centers uh, throughout the country. What these locations are, are locations for people to come in and get connect, get connected to the internet, uh, get resources to learn how to uh, utilize the internet, and then also uh, uh, help us in terms of identifying programs for them to expand uh, uh, and get adoption and affordability solutions as well too. And when I talk about these connected learning centers, the reason why I'm so excited about that relative to uh, third party groups is that we actually partner with a diverse set of third parties to actually enable these type of centers. Uh, these centers are mostly in uh, uh, underprivileged areas and in many cases in diverse areas. Uh, one of the areas that I'm really excited about is in San Francisco, we connected with the local Asian community. They're uh, standing up a connected learning center that allows the people to come in from that community that actually that has the language skills to actually support uh, their adoption and uh, learning of the digital environment. We partner with uh, diverse uh, third parties that actually help set up and maintain uh, the operation of these connected learning centers. And then probably actually even more excitingly, we connect with, um, with different organizations to help with digital literacy program, whether it is Warner Brother in terms of developing content that is unique and interesting for kids to learn, whether it's partnering with Khan Academy in terms of having the resources and the content to allow people to get the most out of these digital connections, or whether it's uh, to actual partner with the Public Library Association and developing other contents that allows people that's newly into this digital environment to learn how to navigate the digital space, how to do it in a way that is safe, uh, how to do it in a way that is uh, helpful to them and the way that they use the services. And we believe that you know, this is an activity that we, can do, we cannot do alone. That is these community organizations, these third parties that really makes these type of activities a lot more beneficial to the people that we're trying to serve. You know, Jeff, I think that's great. And, you know, it's that type of commitment that is certainly needed uh, and needs to be continued across uh, this particular uh, organization and across organizations that are unlike. And uh, it's great to hear that uh, we continue to focus on education because we know that millions of students nationwide lack access to technology and the skills that they need to drop to thrive in a digital world. 
And so uh, we have similar programs here uh, within Verizon. I'm pretty excited about a transformative program that we have called Verizon Innovative Learning. And so this is really uh, an, organ an opportunity where we can work hand in hand with nonprofit partners and also with teams of educators and technology experts uh, to really build and administer STEM-focused programs and inspire students to learn, achieve, and create. Because we understand that uh, these students are the future of of this business and the future of the technology and how that will be actually deployed. So with our Verizon Innovative Learning Schools, uh, we've partnered with a nonprofit organization called Digital Promise. And uh, we provide students and teachers and under-resourced middle schools and high schools across the country uh, where they can receive free devices, including hotspots, uh, for those who may not have reliable internet access, uh, free data, and also uh, innovative technology-driven curriculum, which is really important. So teachers who are participating uh, in the schools also receive some comprehensive training and also resources to help prepare their students for success across the digital economy. So, you know, from our research, uh, for those who have participated, 88% of the teachers said that the program helped them explore new ways of teaching, which is really important. How do we continue to capture the hearts and minds of our students so that they find value and that they're uh, actually interested uh, in technology and how they can get involved? And also 81% of teachers said that the program enhanced their student engagement. So we're pretty excited about what the Verizon Innovative Learning Schools bring to the table and all of the great engagement and participation that we're seeing from the teachers and the students alike. I love this focus on education and I am so proud of something that we do in a similar way to address the digital divide in education is through Project 10 Million, which is a $10.7 billion initiative that we launched in 2020. And this provides free internet service, free mobile hotspots to underconnected households with school-aged children. And our goal is to reach 10 million eligible households over five years. And to date, since we've launched this program, uh, we've connected over 3.9 million students across 15,000 school districts across the country. Country. So we're so excited about this, you know, by giving school districts free and highly subsidized data plans that they can provide to their students for free, connect them. Um, it's just such a, an, an important initiative in bridging that digital divide for our students who need them. One of the things that we've done in partnering with our external diversity council is um, really a focus on executing on a community wireless initiative that will improve access to cutting edge wireless technology, similar to what you know, Jeff ex explained in some of these community centers, which is so important in providing, you know, including 5G to low income, insular, rural and underserved communities. One thing that um, I think is also important to note is really the support that's needed right now for the LGBTQ plus youth who are marginalized right now. And so we've partnered with um, the HRC in a five-year, $1 million investment to build skills for our LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus youth who are marginalized. So those are some of the partnerships that, that I'm really excited about. All of your companies actively participate in federal programs designed to increase access, affordability, and adoption including the new affordable connectivity program and historic programs like Lifeline. What have these programs gotten right? And what should policymakers focus on to continue helping communities of color get and stay connected? Holly, I'll start with you. Sure. You know, I think through the pandemic, we learned more than ever just how um, tremendous the need is to do more for underserved communities to have access to broadband. And we're pleased to see that the government has stepped in and with a number of positive programs for consumers. We applaud agencies like the FCC who have been moving swiftly to implement programs like the Affordable Connectivity Program. And, you know, that program really promises to bring the transformative benefits of broadband services to millions of households in a sustained basis. And we use our Assurance Wireless and Metro by T-Mobile brands to actively enroll ACP customers. And T-Mobile is one of the largest participants um, in this uh, across the nation. But when I think about policymakers and what they can do to focus on, I think about the adoption gap which is the key to reaching those who are unserved, underserved, and to Jeff's point earlier, and facilitating access for these communities. And one of the things that we've learned quite a bit um, as a company is listening to pain points. And it's more important than ever to listen to pain points of our underserved and communities of color and what are those barriers. And we need to take action in removing them. 
you know, when I think about the investments that we've made in our customers, um, we've worked really hard um, with our communities. We have 41% of the Hispanic con consumers, 41% of Asian American consumers, and 39% of Black and African American consumers. And with the massive network improvements that we've made, we're on pace to cover 99% of the U.S. population with 5G in the next few years. And so when I think about how we as carriers can leverage our positions and work together with our government partners. It's just one way we can um, just increase um, our collective in impact. Yeah, I think Ali's spot on, right? I think uh, I think these programs are tremendous in terms of um, really bringing more people into the fold and more people into the digital economy. I think what I would add to that is that here in AT&T, we believe in choice. We believe in that. Uh, I think what, what these programs got right is the ability to utilize these programs to get connectivity in, in whichever way and however way these diverse communities desire. I mean, we are talking about diverse community that has diverse needs. And I think uh, there are going to be cases where fixed wireline type of connection is broadband is the type of connections that is most suited for these communities. There are going to be times where cellular wireless 5G connectivity is the right solution for there. And I think the ability to use these ACP program across whatever type of connectivity solutions that best fits their need is critical. And I think it's important for us as an industry to invest, to invest in 5G, to expand connectivity across you know, urban areas, rural areas. It's important for us to invest in fiber and grow connectivity and fix wireless robust connectivity that allows people to do, you know, services of what is required today, but also services what's required in the future in terms of greater bandwidth requirement, greater speed, low and lower latency, all these type of uh, uh, applications and platforms that would change the way we live, work, and healthcare, and, and all these other type of stuff that, uh, that we've talked about as an industry. And so what these programs got right is the fact that uh, we could there's the flexibility to use a program in the ways that these community needs. But what these programs need is longevity. Right. We need to make sure that there's sufficient funding, that there is a path that these community understand that this is not a short term solution, that we need a long term solution on how to support these communities, because this need that has been identified by the pandemic is not going to go away. It's going to be here and we need to work together on how to figure this out so that we could continue to support them going forth into the future. We don't have a lot of time left, but I really wanted to ask this question, especially with you uh, bringing up the 5G economy and the applications that will really transform lives. I think that's a, a great segue into why is it so important that we get everyone connected? Today's 5G economy connects us to the fast speed, the high capacity, and the low latency that enables new use cases, spanning education, employment, healthcare, and more. I'm gonna ask a two-part question. Can you tell me about some of the latest 5G use cases and applications and how they benefit diverse communities as they bridge the digital divide? And then the second part of why it's important to connect everyone. Taken together, how do the diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts that we've discussed today help support the U.S. economy? You know, you cannot uh, turn on the news, read the newspaper, uh, you know, scroll through your phones, and not hear about the, the, the shortfall that we all have from a workforce perspective. Right. Uh, so not only is it the right thing to do in terms of making sure that everybody has equal access, everybody has the ability to take part and 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 really achieve the American dream of being successful and be part of an industry that's growing and thriving and supporting the community. But also we as a nation need these workforces, need these people to be participating as well too, right? Uh, there is a shortage in, in labor. There is a demand. And the more people that we could get in, it will help everybody move forward. And really, if you think about also how we communicate, how we operate, how we interact with each other, it is more and more in a digital format. And therefore, in that situation, you cannot have a segment at the population that is not connected to the digital world. If there is a networking effect associated with this, the more people that connect into this network, the more people that we interact with, the better this network becomes. And so therefore it is to all of our advantages, to, to our advantage to make sure that everybody's connected. And people realize that as part of the, uh, as part of the pandemic and they see that. And that's the reason why you see so much support coming from uh, the, the public sector and the private sector in, ter in terms of reaching this goal, expanding the connectivity to everybody uh, across the country. 
you know, we kind of led into this conversation talking about education and why it's important for um, our students and teachers to have access. You know, when you think about jobs of the future and uh, where we sit across the continental U.S. as it relates to STEM-related fields, education, having access to technology, that's just another reason why uh, this work is so critically important. Not only are we solving for the problems of today, uh, but we're solving for the economy and the jobs of the future. And so it's important that we continue Continue to equip um, our communities with all the tools and resources available so that they're in a position to innovate and uh, so that we can compete. And I think that we have a responsibility uh, as carriers uh, to work together to solve these issues together. So I think you're spot on, uh, Jeff, and couldn't really couldn't add too much more to that conversation. I'm just excited about the work that we'll continue to do together. And I agree with both of you. And I think that we have a great responsibility as network carriers that serve the entire US population, wherever they are, rural, small town, whether they are in isolated areas. And it's our responsibility as companies who serve diverse consumers, our, not only our customers, but our employees and our communities. It is a responsibility for us to meet this need and to do everything we can. So um, I wanna thank you both for your commitment. And um, I, I agree, really well said from both of you. Thank you very much, everyone. I really wish I could sit here and speak with you all day. The work that you do is that incredible and that important. Thank you so much for joining us today to talk about the incredible work that the wireless industry is doing and continues to do. I'm so glad we had the opportunity today to really shine a light on the investments being made to connect all Americans. We are really making strides and digging into what is working is key. I wanna thank Jeff, Natalie, Holly, and our own Marcella for sharing the initiatives they are leading to expand access. And special thanks to Bob and MMTC for their research and partnership in addressing digital equity. Thanks again for joining us and we'll see you next time.